if you are here this morning and you're visiting, hey, a welcome to you. And, and if you need a Bible today, I encourage you to put your hand up. And I would invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 as we continue on in our series uh, in this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And uh, we are in a, a mini-series, so to speak. And, well, I'll tell you about that in just a moment. But as you walked in, you saw the decorations hanging down. You see the front decorated a bit differently because, as has been uh, already mentioned, this week is vacation Bible school. And all week long, this place is going to be full of energy. And it's going to be really exciting. 205 children have already pre-registered. And... And I was told by Ms. Wendy, our director for children's ministry, that our highest attendance has been 212 children on any one given day, and we already have 205 registered. And so this whole week is going to be a, a great opportunity for the kids to hear about God the Creator and what He wants to do in their lives through Jesus Christ, and an opportunity for them to take that message back uh, to their families and share that message with them. And so we are praying and we're excited about what God is going to do and accomplish in this week. And he's using women and men uh, throughout this week who have sacrificed of their time and energy and, and they're just saying, Lord, use me to, to speak words of love and encouragement to these children. And well, if you are helping out with Vacation Bible School this week, would you stand where you are right now? Would you stand up? I know plenty of people are going to be at the second service because that's when they're going to get ready. But uh, anybody else? I know we're going to have more because we're going to set up after the second service. But hey, let's give them a hand. Thank you already for your service. It's going to be a fantastic week, and let's pray towards that end even right now. Let's pray. Father, we do give you this week, and we pray that as children come in and they see all the space stuff, as one child already said this morning, and uh, they're just captivated by all the energy and the excitement of the week, we pray that in the midst of the fun, in the midst of the games, in the midst of the Bible stories, that they will hear the good news of Jesus Christ and that lives will be changed this week and that those lives will go back to their homes and then they will change, uh, they will be sp uh, spokespeople for you in those homes and we would see whole households come to know the glory, your glory, and what you've done through Jesus Christ. And so we pray a blessing on all those who are serving. We pray a blessing on every child and every family they represent as they come in this week. And we give it all to you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, as I mentioned, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we've been exploring Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, seeking to learn from them. And, and this mini-series, as we've called it, as we're going through this section, is called I Surrender All, that what we need to to explore in terms of what we need to let go of and what we need to pick up, what we need to turn over to God and say, God, it is all yours. Because Paul is challenging the people in this church to let go of certain things, to let go of their attitudes, to let go of some of the decisions that they've made. And so for today, as we're looking at one of those issues that Paul is addressing about how the heart is pulled in different directions. And so he goes by reaching back into the history of the people of Israel and he brings forward the very real pressures that those people faced and how their heart was divided as temptations came their way and they yielded to those temptations. They gave in to those temptations. And Paul looks at them and he says they were given as an example to us because where you're living in the city of Corinth, there are temptations all around you. They would wake up in the morning, step outside their door, and boom, right away. It was just one thing after another that sought to pull their hearts apart and divide their loyalties. And, and if truth be told, as we look in the mirror, we know we can experience that also. 
We know we can experience the tugs and the pulls as soon as we wake up in the morning. We're assaulted by it, and, and we feel the, the strain and the pressure, and, and, and we feel the temptations that come our way. And so Paul is writing to this church, and he's writing to us today, and we need to hear that we need to surrender our divided hearts and be aware. Be aware. Let's turn and let's take a look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 10 where Paul writes these words to this church. He's still answering a question that he introduced back in chapter 8 where he was addressing a question that they had asked him about, you know, what's the relationship? How do we, how do we deal with uh, these times when you know, we're supposed to sit down for a meal and there's eat that's, uh, meat that's been sacrificed to an idol. How do we deal with this? And some of the practical issues that they were dealing with. And he, he starts in chapter 10 and verse 1 this way. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses, into the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and they drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it was written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must, must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we uh, break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to partic be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Paul finishes up this passage, uh, this section, if you will. And, and if we were to highlight it, if we were to pull out what he's saying here, first of all, he says, Israel experienced the power of God's deliverance from slavery in Egypt. That's what he was talking about in those very first verses that I read. That he led them out from slavery with a promised future before them. But even with seeing all that God had done on their behalf, they grumbled. Now, this kind of grumbling that, that Paul's referring to is not just a, a, a one-time occurrence. It's a, it's a constant state of grumbling. They were calling into question the goodness of God and what God had done on their behalf. And they then committed idolatry. In other words, they looked around, saw what others in the land were worshiping, and they said, well, we want to worship that too. And so they tried to bring it into their worship. 
And Paul is saying, no, you can't have a divided heart like that. And that's why he says, flee idolatry. As you think about idolatry, oftentimes we think of something that's in the form of a, of a stone or piece of wood, something that's shaped. But, but really, what Paul is addressing here, what he's speaking to is it begins actually in the heart. It can be that thought or pursuit that becomes so all-encompassing that we make excuses for it, we foster it, we spend for it. It does not even have to be so all-encompassing as to demand everything that we have, but our hearts and minds grow dull and distracted from what the Lord has called us to do and who we are as his people. And so Paul is saying to them, you don't have any reason to have a divided heart because you are free in Christ. Don't be divided people with a divided heart. Follow after God. Follow after Christ. Don't grow lazy in your freedom with Jesus. But be aware. Be aware. Keep your eyes wide open because those temptations are going to come. As he says in verse 12, a, a very critical verse here in this passage, he says, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Uh, be careful. Be aware. Don't be so cocksure in yourself and in your abilities and where you stand that you let your guard down and you're not walking with a heart that's guarded against the tensions. When he said there in verse 1, I want you to know, brothers, uh, do you recall one of the issues that the Corinthians are dealing with? They're dealing with that sense of pride. Like, we got our act together. We know it all. We're in a position of strength. Paul says, no. Don't, don't elevate yourself to that level because when you do, be careful. You're setting yourself up for a fall if it's all based on you. Now this next verse, I encourage you, I would challenge you, I am asking you, I am pleading with you. As my brothers and sisters in Christ, memorize this verse because it has so much hope to give in the midst of a world that pulls on our hearts and we see temptations all around us. When Paul writes, and again, I just want to read it again so we hear it and, and let it sink deep into your heart. Let it sink deep into your soul. Because I know, I know, there's any number of us who are wrestling this day with things that are tugging and pulling upon us. Paul says this, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, there, there are four things I want to highlight from this verse. There are four matters that I want us to draw our attention to because, well, Frankly, I, I think this verse is what we need to, to be practicing in terms of understanding who we are as a, as a child of God, as a son or as a daughter of God, and, and, and making sure our heart is not pulled apart, is not torn in two. He starts off and he says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is not common to man. In other words, no temptation is yours alone. Now, I hope for somebody out here this morning that these are comforting words. That no temptation, no struggle that you're going through right now is unique to you. There are others who have gone through it, are going through it. Uh, they will go through it at some point. You know, we need to get past the thinking that we're alone that then sets us up for defeat and, and embarrassment because, ah, oh, we're, we're the only one who's fallen. 
You see, this temptation that Paul is talking about is, is that pull that pulls us away from God. In other words, it's that pull that makes us cross a line. And, and it's not just like a temptation about, you know, should I have that second piece of cake for dessert? Uh, this is, a, this is a, a lapse such that we, we shake our fist against God and say, God, I'm going to do it my way. See, the promise of temptation is there is a better future, that I can find something better for me than what God has promised me. And that is the, that's the promise that temptation holds out. You go back to Genesis, and what did the serpent say to Eve? You know, don't you know? You know, did, did God really say this? And it planted that thought in and it just grew from there so that both Eve and Adam succumbed. And the, and the origin of temptation, well, it's, it could be our own desires going one step further. Somebody asked Rockefeller, one of the richest men of his day many years ago, how much is enough? And he said, one dollar more. But, you know, if you think about it, our own desires can can follow suit with that. Like, there's nothing wrong with having a trade or a career. As a matter of fact, those are good things to make a living with. But where maybe our, the temptation is to, to start to let it define us, that we see our value in what we contribute or what we amass to ourselves, and, and not in terms of who we are before God. Oh, it could be in relationships. And hey, indeed, relationships are a good thing, right? But then if all of a sudden my day is defined by whether or not somebody liked a Facebook post that I made or a, an Instagram that I put up there, and if they did, my heart is crushed. Or in the pursuit of relationships, I, 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 have, a, I have a spouse, but I'm looking around. Or in, in relationships, it's where I'm constantly looking and, and the more friends I got, somehow that builds me up and it makes me feel affirmed. The origin of temptations is taking our own desires, which can be good in and of themselves, but taking that one step further, that one dollar more. And then, of course, you have Satan, who's not a very creative person, but he just takes what he sees happening and he takes a little gas and he throws it on there to see what else is going to flare up. But lest you think he is simply an arsonist running around with a gas can, you got to know what Peter says. Peter says, Satan is a lion looking whom he may devour, looking whom he may take advantage of. So when temptation comes, the source of it could be within ourselves. It could also be amplified by, by Satan trying to press and push and, and make us go that one step more. And then, of course, when we go over that line, when we take that one additional step, the, the danger, the yielding to temptation is that it, it creates a hardness in my, in my heart. I'm not as responsive to the call of God. And my heart, my loyalty is split in two because, uh, you know, I, I want it this way and I want it that way. And, and the further and further I go, well, have you ever heard about what happens to a person who tries to straddle a picket fence? They impale themselves, right? You can't do it. That is the reality of temptation and and. And maybe this week you look back and you say, oh man, I know what you're talking about because I gave in. And I can feel it in my heart, that sense of defeat, that embarrassment. I come to worship. I want to sing about the love of God, but I, I'm not sure that he loves me. Well, let me just say that as Paul started off here, you are not alone. And, and here you got to see this, this phrase. Please look at it with me. 
What's it say? God is faithful. Do you believe that? Let's try it again. God is faithful. God is faithful. He's faithful to his word. You, you go through and you start in Genesis, you read through Revelation, and any number of times he speaks about the love that he has for his people, the concern he has for his people. The times when he said, oh, I will never forget you, I will not forsake you, I will never leave you. You are mine. You do not need to worry about going to God in prayer and feeling like you're on the line and, and he's there and he's got you on hold and he's saying like, who is this again? Uh, how do they spell their name? What do they want? God knows you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He is faithful to his word and he's faithful to his people. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are one of his sons, you are one of his daughters. And he's crying out to you saying, son, daughter, come to me. Don't let your heart be divided. Don't let your heart be hardened. Come to me and experience love. Come to me, experience forgiveness. Come to me and experience embrace. Come to me, experience peace and a future and a hope. Oh, we also see here in this verse that God is sovereign. It says, he will not let you tempt, be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will pro also provide that way of escape. God is sovereign. In other words, there are limits God is sovereign, and he opens up that door any number of times by personal testimony. I can tell you, I won't go into details right at the moment, but if you want to, we can talk one-on-one. -on -one. But there's any number of times saying, God, come on. I've said to him, God, come on. You know, I was being tempted, and I gave in. And he says, look in the rearview mirror, buddy. And I look in the rearview mirror, and here are all these exit ramps. Here are all these signs saying, don't go down that one-way road. There's a dead end. Turn here. Get off here. Call a brother who will pray with you. Dig into my word. Spend time just quietly reflecting on the promises of my word. Here are all these exits. Get help. Read a good book. Do anything else, but don't go down this way. And I'm like, okay, yeah. I guess you did provide those ways out. And I was just not aware because I had narrowed my focus down to what I wanted. Oh, God, forgive me. But in his faithfulness and his sovereignty, in putting limits and, and providing relief, providing those open doors, fourthly, God is faithful and sovereign. He enables his people to stand because we are not standing alone. As his son, as his daughter, he is there with us. And we can stand, as he says, there, that you may be able to, what's it say? Endure it. That you may be able to go through this season of temptation. That means that God doesn't necessarily stop the temptation right then and there, but he calls us to walk through it by trusting in his presence, trusting in his goodness, trusting in his love for us. And so we stand by looking up. We don't look around us. We don't look down, but we need to keep looking up. There was a few weeks ago where I was, you know, I was just feeling frustrated by life. There were just a number of things going on here at the church, on the home front. I mean, just on the home front, it was just like, after all these things have been accumulating, I opened up my computer, powered it up, and the thing died. And it's like, oh. You know, and I was letting it eat at me. And, and you know, I could recount all the things that were frustrating me in the moment, but uh, they just felt a bit... And all of a sudden, I, I discovered I was looking down as I'd been looking around my situation. I let my head drop down. I'm like, I am so discouraged, God. 
how can I, you know, you call me to keep going, but how can I keep going? And, and there was that word, keep looking up. Even in the midst of the struggle, say, yes, even in this, I believe. Yes, even in this, I will trust. Yes, even in this, God is my hope. He is my deliverer. God is faithful. He is sovereign, and he will see me through it. And the greatest testimony of his commitment to you and to me is that we are able to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We are able to celebrate communion together in which we remember what Christ did on the cross for us. And it is a celebration because in it, as we take the bread, as we take the cup, we are celebrating God's love for us. And, and by way of a transition, you know, it, it is great to be able to rejoice with what the Lord is going to do in Vacation Bible School this week. But it's also great to rejoice in what God is, is doing today in our midst and how he's changing hearts and lives right here among us. And, and actually, it's, it's really an awesome opportunity for me and it really does it blesses my heart to invite pastor carl back he, he's back from sabbatical okay. he's going to lead us in celebrating the lord's supper together